Hello again, and welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to be looking at respiration, um, basically covering the content for GCSE. Um, in this lesson, we're going to be looking at the different subtopics I've listed on the screen. Uh, we're going to define respiration. We're going to talk about where respiration occurs in cells. We're going to talk about mitochondria and how they're adapted to their function. We're going to talk about um, aerobic respiration and what the equation for aerobic respiration is. We're also going to talk about um, ATP and its role within cells and how it's linked to respiration. We're going to um, talk about the distinction between respiration and breathing. They are not the same thing and a lot of people tend to mix them up but i'll clarify that in this lesson we're then going to talk about anaerobic respiration and how this differs from aerobic respiration and then finally we're going to give some examples of industrial um, industrial processes or commercial applications um, for anaerobic respiration so let's dig in so here's the worksheet. As usual, you should um, be filling this in as you watch the video. So let's put down a definition for respiration. So respiration is a process used by cells to release energy by breaking by breaking bonds in molecules now that's um, now this energy could be then subsequently stored within another molecule in the cells, which we'll talk about in a second, or it could just be released as things like heat. It depends on the situation. So most of the reactions involved with respiration take place in structures or organelles within cells called mitochondria. So that's the plural, mitochondria. The singular is mitochondrion. And you can see there a diagram of a mitochondrion. Okay, so you've got um, on the left two uh, diagrams, a diagram of a cell showing a mitochondrion, and then it then zooms in on the mitochondrion. And then on the right, you've got um, a photograph from an electron microscope showing um, the internal structure of an actual mitochondrion rather than just a drawing. Okay, so let's have a look at that structure. As you can see, within the structure of the mitochondrion, you can see folds. The inner membrane is folded repeatedly. Think about that for a second and try to figure out why the inner mitochondrial, mitochondrial membrane might be folded. I'll give you a second to think about it. Well, the inner mitochondrial membrane is um, folded in that way to form cristae, which increase the surface area available for respiration. So this increases the surface area available for respiration okay so that's why it's folded and generally speaking if you get a question at GCSE or a level um, where you're asked um, why um, a structure is folded in a certain way or folded repeatedly it's often to do with increasing the surface area available. So next step, we're going to be looking at 
the two main forms of respiration. We'll start off with aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration requires oxygen. Okay, now at GCSE, you could be asked um, to complete or to write out a whole equation for aerobic respiration. You have to be specific in your answer. So you could either be asked for the word equation or the formula equation. Don't mix them up and don't mix and match them. So for the word equation, you start off with glucose, which is the respiratory fuel. And then because it's aerobic respiration in this case, you use oxygen. Okay. And then you end up releasing carbon dioxide, water, and energy. We're not putting energy into this equation because energy is not a substance, and as such, it's not in the equation. However, you could put it into the equation. It wouldn't be too much of a problem unless they specified that they wanted an equation with the substances. Okay, so the full formula um, equation, we need to put down the formulae for the different um, substances or molecules within the equation. So we'll start off with glucose, which is C6H12O6. Okay, and that means it's got six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. You then have oxygen, which is O2, and then you have carbon dioxide, which is CO2, and then water, which is H2O. Now, there's a problem with this equation. If you do chemistry, you'll be able to notice that it is not balanced. So how do we balance this equation? Let's have a look. So on the left-hand side, we've got six carbon atoms, but on the right-hand side, we've only got one. So in order to balance this out, we need to put a six in front of the CO2. Now, on both sides of the arrow, we have six carbon atoms, six carbons in the glucose molecule. And now that we've multiplied the carbon dioxide molecule by six, we have six carbons on the right hand side. Now let's go on to the hydrogen atoms. On the left hand side in glucose, as I mentioned earlier, there are 12 hydrogen atoms. However, on the right hand side in water, we only have two. So we need to multiply the water molecules by six. Now, if we have a look, on the left hand side, we've still got the 12 hydrogen atoms from um, in the glucose. But on the right hand side, because we've multiplied the um, water molecules by six, we now have six multiplied by two, 12 hydrogen atoms on the right hand side. Okay, so now let's look at oxygen. On the left hand side of the equation, you've got six oxygens in glucose plus another two from oxygen. That gives us eight on the left hand side. Now, if we go on to the right hand side, we've got six multiplied by two in the carbon dioxide uh, molecule. So six multiplied by two gives you 12 oxygens from carbon dioxide. And now we also have six multiplied by one in the um, water molecules, giving you another six oxygen atoms. That gives a total of 18. So you've got 18 um, oxygen atoms on the right hand side, but on the left hand side, you've got eight. So it's not balanced. Now we can't touch the glucose molecule because we've already balanced the carbons and the hydrogens. So any numbers that we're going to change will be to do with the oxygen molecule on the left hand side. So what do we need to put in front of that? We need to put in a six. So let's have a look at how that now pans out. So we've got six um, oxygens in the glucose molecule plus the six times two, 12 oxygens 
with the water because we've now multiplied the water molecule by six. And now we have 18 atoms of oxygen on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we still have 18 because we've got six multiplied by the two in carbon dioxide, giving you 12, plus six multiplied by one with the water, giving you another six. So now on both sides, the oxygen atoms are balanced. So all of the different elements are balanced on both sides of the equation now. That's an easy way to balance equations. Okay. So now let's go down to the next page. So the energy released from respiration must be stored in a form which cells can use. Because if it's not stored, it's simply released as heat, which sometimes is desirable, but very often could be dangerous or undesirable. And as such, you need to have a mechanism, means by which you can store that ATP. Okay, so the molecule used to store energy is called ATP. The energy um, below, uh, or sorry, the diagram below shows how ATP works. And if you look at that picture, it looks um, a bit like a battery or a cell, um, uh, electrical cell. So if you have a look there, you can see that on the left hand side, you've got a partially charged molecule, ADP. And when you fully charge it, you do so by adding another phosphate group to it. So on the left, you had ADP, adenosine diphosphate, that's two phosphate groups attached. And on the right hand side, you've added another phosphate group, making it adenosine triphosphate, ATP, with three phosphate groups attached. The, the bonds between the phosphate groups and adenosine are high energy bonds. They can store a lot of energy within the bonds. And once, you've, once you break those bonds, you can release that energy. And the energy that is released by ATP is done in small chunks or small amounts, which the cell can use, rather than just flooding out vast amounts of energy, which the cell would possibly not be able to use. So let's write something down for that. ATP works a bit like a rechargeable battery. How is the process described above similar to a rechargeable battery? So let's think about that. So when you charge up um, uh, ATP or ADP, when you charge it up, you're adding a phosphate group to it. So we're going to put in charging and then we're going to put in discharging or using the energy, okay? So when you charge up um, the molecule, what you're doing is you're adding a phosphate group to ADP. So you're adding a phosphate group to ADP, converting it to ATP and storing energy. The reverse releases energy. So by removing a phosphate group from ATP this time, okay? So that's how it works, and that's why it's similar in a way to a rechargeable battery, like a cell's rechargeable battery in essence. So list three uses of energy or ATP in cells. So cells need energy to carry out all sorts of processes. In cells, the currency, if you want to think of it that way, the currency for energy is ATP. So if, for instance, you went off to um, a country like Nigeria, 
the currency there something called the Naira. Over in the United Kingdom, the currency used is the pound. So in both countries, the currency used is different. And as such, you can't spend Naira in the United Kingdom and vice versa. Instead, you have to convert it. So energy might come into the body in the form of food like glucose. But that is not a currency that the cells can actually use. It's not a currency that the cells can expend in order to carry out a process. It must be converted first into ATP, which a cell can use for cellular processes. So that's how that works. So three possible uses of energy or ATP in cells are number one, something like active transport. Okay, so active transport is one of the um, possibilities. Another could be something like muscle contraction. So muscle contraction. And then finally, another um, possibility, because we only asked for three, so another um, possibility could be making complex molecules. Okay, so let's explain why energy is needed for each of these processes. So active transport, energy is needed to move molecules and it is required because the molecules are being moved against their concentration gradient so molecules tend to move down their concentration gradient from a high concentration to a low concentration naturally but if you want to do the reverse you need energy muscle contraction during muscle contraction, you need ATP in order to bring about certain changes to certain uh, molecules. If you go on to do um, muscle contraction at A level, you'll get a little bit more detail on how that works. So ATP is required for this. And then making complex molecules. If you're making complex molecules from simpler ones, you're making new bonds, which means that in order to make new bonds, you have to trap energy within those bonds. And ATP supplies that energy that the um, cells can use to actually make new bonds. So ATP supplies energy to make new bonds. Okay, so those are three possible uses of ATP. All right, so there's a common misconception amongst lots of people. They think that respiration and breathing are the same thing. Actually, they are not. So let's have a look at this. So respiration and breathing are not the same thing. Let's look at two ways in which they differ from each other. The location. Respiration takes place in cells. So it takes place at the cellular level. Whereas breathing takes place in organs called lungs. So breathing takes place in the lungs. So not at a cellular level, okay? What's the purpose of respiration? As I said, it supplies energy for cellular processes such as active transport. Breathing on the other hand 
simply facilitates gaseous exchange. So facilitates gaseous exchange. Okay, so obviously breathing is linked to respiration in a way because it supplies the oxygen that's required for it and then helps to get rid of the water vapor and carbon dioxide generated by it. Let's go on to the next stage, which is anaerobic respiration. So anaerobic respiration is respiration without oxygen. And we'll talk about how that's possible in a second. So sometimes um, anaerobic respiration is required by organisms, either to supplement aerobic respiration or to replace it altogether. So in organisms like humans, like ourselves, we use um, res uh, anaerobic respiration basically to supplement aerobic respiration. So we are facultative anaerobes. We have the ability to basically um, add on a bit more anaerobic respiration on top of our aerobic respiration. Whereas some organisms can switch entirely to anaerobic respiration. And those could be, those are described as um, obligate anaerobes. So some organisms only ever use anaerobic respiration. So obligate anaerobes, they are obliged to use anaerobic respiration. So let's complete this table to differentiate between aerobic and anaerobic. So the location of the reactions. So in, an, in aerobic respiration, it's two different locations. You've also got, you've got the cytoplasm of cells and the mitochondria. Whereas in anaerobic respiration, it all happens in the cytoplasm. Okay, the uh, next step, amount of um, energy released. So in aerobic respiration, you end up with more energy or ATP than anaerobic. Whereas in anaerobic respiration, you end up with less energy, joke ATP, only about 10% um, compared to um, aerobic respiration using the same amount of respiratory fuel or glucose. So less energy than aerobic. Okay. How about toxins? In aerobic respiration, there aren't really any toxins released. So, nil. I can hear some of you thinking, oh, how about carbon dioxide? Isn't that toxic? Only if you've got enough of it. And quite frankly, that's not going to be the case in this case. So, not really. In anaerobic respiration, on the other hand, in plants and yeast, so let's do that in a different color. So in animals first, and then plants and yeast. So in animal cells, you end up with something called lactic acid, which can cause cramps. And in plant cells and yeast, you end up with ethanol, or alcohol, which can build up to toxic levels and kill the plant or yeast cells. So is oxygen required for aerobic respiration? Yes. Is it required for anaerobic respiration? No. Okay, so there's the table completed. Next. Suggest a situation in humans when anaerobic respiration would be required. 
and describe why it would be necessary. Okay, so anaerobic respiration is, um, as I said, in humans, a way to supplement aerobic respiration. Eventually, you get to a point where you are carrying out aerobic respiration as quickly as you physically can. Think for a second about why you get to a limit as to how much aerobic respiration can happen in animal cells. I'll give you, or in any cells really, uh, I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay, so the reason why is in humans, as I said earlier, breathing is linked to the rate of respiration. Why? Because it supplies the oxygen required and helps to get rid of the carbon dioxide and water. That means that there's a limit to how much oxygen can come in and how quickly CO2 and water vapor can be removed. Eventually, once you get to the limit, how fast you can breathe, you're going to be limiting the amount of aerobic respiration that can occur. And as after that point, any extra energy that's required will have to come from another process, anaerobic respiration. In the future, we'll be able to look at anaerobic respiration in more detail to talk about why it's necessary and how it works exactly. But for now, we can just keep this to the basics. So when is it required? So um, something like intense exercise, e.g. running. And why is it required to supplement? Let's sort out my handwriting there to supplement aerobic respiration. Basically, to supply extra ATP required during the activity. Okay, next. Give an example of an industrial process in which anaerobic respiration is used. So as I said earlier, um, plant and yeast cells produce alcohol um, as a byproduct of anaerobic respiration. And alcohol can be a desired um, product for making alcoholic drinks or uh, medical um, applications and so on. So that's an example of an industrial process in which anaerobic respiration is used. So in fermentation to produce alcohol or ethanol. Now, I only asked for one example, but I'll give you a second example. So um, another is in um, baking. So in baking, to cause bread to rise. And in essence, in anaerobic respiration, in um, yeast um, cells, one of the byproducts is carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide forms bubbles in um, the dough and it causes it to rise. And that's why you end up with um, bread being fluffy. Okay, so yeast is used in brewing and in the production of ginger beer. Lashings and lashings of ginger beer. Under anaerobic um, conditions, yeast and plants produced, um, produce ethanol as a byproduct. How are such processes self-limiting. Basically, how do you limit um, the uh, fermentation process? So let's break this down. In beer, um, the concentration of ethanol is 
between about sort of three to six percent. Okay. Once the ethanol or alcohol levels reach toxic levels or once the uh, let's let's change that make the sentence read a little bit better so once the ethanol or alcohol concentration reaches toxic levels then the yeast cells die thus limiting the process and this is useful because um, a long time ago our ancestors lived in a world where it was probably a lot more dangerous to drink um, water of unknown provenance um, water from say for instance a river or lake or something like that which might be contaminated with sewage so you might be drinking poo water, which is not just unpleasant, but could also cause quite serious um, side effects like disease, cholera, and so on. And um, as such, it was actually safer to drink alcoholic drinks. So um, young, even young people would have been drinking mead mixed with milk or something like that. Okay. And... Um, that was beneficial to our ancestors. But if um, anaerobic respiration was not self-limiting, the um, concentration of alcohol in those drinks would reach such toxic levels that it would be undrinkable for humans. So this is a benefit of the process. It's self-limiting. Okay, so that's... Um, it on um, the content for this topic. So let's have a quick um, summary of what we've done so far. So there's our summary of the content um, of this lesson. We started off by defining respiration. It's a process used to release energy by breaking bonds in complex molecules. And um, that energy can then either be released just as heat or it could be used to make ATP, which could then be used for cellular processes. Next, we talked about where the reactions of respiration take place. They take place in, uh, or most of the reactions take place in the mitochondria, organelles within cells. Part of the reaction actually takes place in the cytoplasm of cells. In the future, if you go on to do um, biology at A-level, you could get more detail on exactly where all of these steps occur. Next, we talked about the structure of mitochondria. So the mitochondria um, have a folded inner membrane, and that folded inner membrane increases the surface area available. And because you have an increased surface area available, the reaction can happen faster. Next, we talked about um, aerobic respiration. So aerobic respiration requires oxygen and the, um, the fuel that's used is glucose. The glucose reacts with the oxygen to release carbon dioxide and water and energy is also released because you're breaking bonds within the glucose molecule. And as you break the bonds, energy is released. Okay, so the next... Um, step that energy that's released shouldn't just be or hopefully isn't just going to be released um, in vast amounts of heat you want it to be released in controlled steps and those controlled steps can then be used to make atp so you'll end up with a certain amount of atp per molecule of glucose that you break down so what is atp ATP is a high energy molecule um, which uh, can store energy between, within the bonds um, between phosphate groups. 
So as you add phosphate groups going from um, adenosine diphosphate to adenosine triphosphate, you trap energy within that bond. And when you want to get the energy back, you simply reverse it and you take the um, phosphate group off and you end up with um, ADP being regenerated. So basically it can move cycle between being um, storing energy and releasing the energy, a bit like a rechargeable battery in something like your laptop or your mobile phone. Next, um, we talked about possible um, applications or uses of ATP energy in cells. So that could include things like muscle contraction or making large complex molecules from simpler ones because you need to make bonds. And when you make bonds, you need to trap energy. And that energy is supplied by the ATP. Or for something like active transport, because you're moving or forcing molecules to move against their concentration gradient. And in order to do that, you need energy. Okay, and then we talked about the distinction between breathing and respiration. Breathing and respiration are not the same thing. So, for instance, we call um, the system with which we breathe the respiratory system, but that's a bit of a misnomer. Misnomer means a name that doesn't actually tell you what that system does. So, even though we call it the respiratory system, it's probably more accurately the breathing system. Okay, so what's the difference between them? Breathing is the means by which we facilitate gaseous exchange. We supply um, oxygen and we take away carbon dioxide and water vapor. Whereas respiration is the process used to release energy from breaking bonds in molecules. And then finally, we talked about anaerobic respiration. And anaerobic respiration does not require oxygen. Problem with anaerobic respiration is that it is less efficient than aerobic respiration. Less efficient because it produces less ATP per molecule of the respiratory fuel, in this case, glucose. And as such, it would be like having two totally identical cars, identical in every way, the same comfort, they look the same, same color, everything about them is the same. But one burns 10% more or um, 10 times more fuel than the other. So, of course, you're going to choose the more efficient one. Because if it's the same in every other way, then it's the most logical um, car to choose. And this is what happens with cells. Cells choose, if they can, to use aerobic respiration and will use anaerobic respiration only if they have no other option, really. Or if, for instance, it's an organism that just hasn't evolved um, aerobic um, respiration. Okay, so what other issues arise from using anaerobic respiration. So another issue uh, with using anaerobic respiration is the fact that toxins are made. So in animals, the toxin would be lactic acid. In um, plants and yeast, the um, uh, toxic byproduct would be ethanol and alcohol and lots of other um, different substances uh, um, organisms produce other um, toxins when they carry out anaerobic respiration, it all depends. But the net takeaway from that is that anaerobic respiration usually produces toxins, which makes it undesirable. Okay, so um, that was basically where we ended the lesson. As usual, what I would suggest is that you um, repeat anything you're trying to learn several times so that it's more likely that it sticks. So you might want to watch this video a few more times, fill in the worksheet a few more times, and then eventually get to a point where you can fill in a blank version of the worksheet from memory without having to watch the video or look back at your notes. That's your end goal. So you need to keep doing this until you can achieve um, what I've just described, being able to refill the worksheet without looking at this video or any of your notes. 
that takes repetition, doing it over and over again. And going back to the motto for this um, uh, channel, it's revision in little bits, but often. So you need to keep doing that over and over again till information sticks. If you found this all um, useful, I would be so grateful if you click the like button below. And if you want to be notified um, when I post more videos in the future, you would probably like to um, subscribe if you haven't already done so. So that's the end of another video. Thanks a lot for watching. And I hope that you found all of this very useful and it helps you to actually achieve success in exams. Bye.